Behind these doors lie spellbinding adventures, secret chambers, and fantastic beasts of a special kind, all brought to life with a little magic. A little museum magic. Welcome to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Like many museums, this museum isn't just home to exciting exhibitions. Behind the scenes, we house over four million items in our collection. That's right, over four million items, including everything from sherds of ancient pottery, prehistoric fossils, meteorites, and much more. There are so many items in the collection here that less than 1% of all of our specimens are on display. The rest are stored in special spaces hidden throughout the building. Like this one. So why do museums keep so many collections items hidden away? Why not bring them out for all to see? For one, some items might be culturally sensitive, one of a kind, or easily damaged. Museums have a responsibility to care for their collections in perpetuity. That means forever. Sometimes it's just too risky to have something on display. In addition, many scientists use museum collections to make new discoveries. Scientists might analyze DNA, compare fossils found in different areas, and see how a species has changed across time, all with help from museum specimens. Keeping these items in perpetuity means making sure that these research collections are around hundreds or even thousands of years from now. When we say forever, we mean it. Oh, really? Collections witches again. But that doesn't mean that 99% of museum collections never see the light of day. Quite the opposite. We know that learning in museums is made more fun by getting to see and even touch real objects, and a team of two wonderful witches cares for those fantastic beasts that emerge to enchant our museum guests. Let's go meet them. That usually works. Um, no? Open! Open! Hi, Talia. Y you want to come in? Hi, Colleen. Yeah. Can yeah. I can I come in? Yeah. Come on. Okay. Thanks. That's it's usually works. I don't know what the deal was. This corner of the castle is called the Figgins Collections Range, and it's home to the museum's Education Collection. This special space houses thousands of items, everything from bears to wolves to bighorn sheep to Evelyn's to Colleen's to astronauts and so much more. While these collections items are stored just as carefully as our research collections, there's something special about the curiosities in these cabinets. So, Evelyn, Colleen, both of you are education collections managers. What does that mean? So we're responsible for the nearly 40,000 objects that we have in storage over here, um, for their care, for their preservation, but also to make them available for educators in the museum to develop programs and put out on the floor for people to touch, interact with, and make their own discoveries. I think a really great analogy would be thinking about what a librarian does. It's their job to keep track of all the books that are in their library. They put numbers on them so they can keep track of them. Visitors come in and ask them questions looking for specific books. They have a computer that they can go to to look up information about the books they have. What we do here is really similar. We just don't have any books. We have objects and specimens here that we're keeping track of. So we're putting numbers on things. We have a computer that we're tracking everything that's in this room. So when someone comes and ask for something, hopefully we can find it and we can help them with what they need. What makes education collections different from research collections? Well, research collections is used either on display in exhibit or it's used by actual researchers who are here doing science. The education collection is a little bit different. We use our collections for kids who are coming for field trips. We use collections in classes. We do loans to area teachers. We provide collections to our researchers, maybe when they're going to give a lecture and they want to have something that their audience might want to interact with or touch. 
And it, when people come to visit the museum, there are carts that they can interact with and there might be classes that folks are taking. If you get to touch something in this building, most likely it came from this collection. We allow people to get a lot closer to our objects and specimens than you will be allowed to do in a research collection. There's a lot of rules about touching things in research collections. So Evelyn, we might use these collection specimens a little bit differently than our research collections, but we're still tasked with taking good care of them for generations to come. How do you make sure that these items are going to be in good shape years in the future? So unlike our research collections, we don't necessarily think about keeping these in perpetuity. Um, we keep these for public education and public learning. And as such, we do have things here that uh, are rare, like the tiger that's here behind me and the snow leopard and polar bear that are over here. These are things that we are not going to necessarily be able to get a second one of, or maybe even in a generation, we won't have polar bears anymore. So we want to take care of these things long, long, long into the future, but also keep the promise to the museum and to our community that we're going to make these animals available for education and their own personal discoveries. So that means that some things we can't touch, right? Some things we can? Yep, absolutely. Um, we will make an assessment on the object as to what we think it can handle. Um, some things like porcupines, I don't want you touching. Um, I don't think you want to touch. I don't. Or other things, it's like the spacesuit where it's white and after 100,000 people touch it, it's going to turn yellow. So we make a decision based on what we think the um, ability of an object is to take handling. So sometimes it's worth the risk. I think for learning science, it's almost always worth the risk. Awesome. So Colleen, this seems like a fascinating job. What sort of unique or exciting tasks do you get to do in your work? Well, some of the best things about working in this job is that we get to help put maybe carts together when temporary exhibits come through and they're only here for a short time. If we have something in this collection that would make that better and more interesting for our visitors, we get to work on those. Uh, every now and then there's a really new exciting discovery that's made and we get a really last minute phone call that says, hey, can you help us with this new and exciting school program that we're working on or scientists in action that we're going to go do? Um, I also really enjoy when we get to put loans together for teachers. Uh, so we get to put collections into a tub that the teachers get to take back to their classrooms and interact with their students, which is really fun to think that kids can interact with the stuff from this room without having to be here in the building. So no two days are the same, right? Not at all. Not at all. Actually, I have a really fun game that I play where I try to figure out what's exciting about today that I'm not going to get to do tomorrow. So how did you both end up with such incredible jobs? Did you go to school to work in museums? Did you study science, maybe do something else? So I actually went to school for geological engineering. Um, it didn't work out so well, I flunked out of school. I came back to Denver and went to school for anthropology. And for my master's work, I ended up working in Peru uh, doing Andean archeology, span I'm an archeologist. Uh, that kind of led to a position here when the position came open for the education collections manager. And here we are. Here we are. As a kid, I, I loved science and I loved all aspects of science. As I got a little bit older, I realized I really liked cultures and people. But when I started university, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. I thought it was, there were so many different sciences to choose from. Uh, and I actually found a school here, local in Denver, that let me write my own degree. So I got to do exactly what I wanted, which was write a degree to be a collections manager which I found really exciting and I really loved. So that meant that you got to go to university and write a degree to do exactly what you wanted to do. That's amazing. And it's interesting, a lot of schools have this option. They just kind of keep it hidden. You have to kind of hunt for it. There you go, you gotta ask for what you want. That's right. And finally, Evelyn and Colleen, do you have any advice for people who are interested in learning more about fantastic beasts or about what museums do? Well, firstly, I'd say go to your local museum, see if they have volunteer opportunities. A lot of museums do. If you don't have access to a local museum, just stay curious. Go out to your own backyard, your own driveway, your own dirt road, or your own pavement. There is stuff to be found there. As an archaeologist, I have to say keep looking down. Like, you'll never know what you're going to find. Like, something different, something strange, something pretty, something ugly. It doesn't matter. Stay curious about what that thing is. Awesome. I would totally agree with that. I would also suggest go hit up your local library. Librarians know a lot about what they have in their libraries. Also, do what the rest of us do, hop online. If you have something you're interested in, go see if somebody's posted something, if there's some really cool information from maybe an educational website. But most importantly, I would agree, just stay curious. There's a lot to learn out there. Keep asking questions. Well, Evelyn, Colleen, thank you so much for letting me come up and check out this secret chamber. 
while I'm up here, can I take a look around? I solemnly swear that I'll be really good. Probably, yeah. I yeah. think it's okay. Right. okay. Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. If you're interested in learning more about these fantastic beasts and where we store them, check out dmns.org slash science to learn more. Okay, let's go. Um, do you have any dragons in here? We have dinosaurs in here. Okay, yeah. but what about dragon eggs? Dinosaurs, Talia. Okay, but what about like impressions of dragon skin? You can tell me. I know if it's a secret, it's okay. No, we have dinosaurs. We can, have dinosaur impressions of dinosaur okay, skin. But what about like, no dragons? What about a basilisk? Do you have one of those? No. <sighs> Fine. And it was here. Oh, stupid hat. Okay, we're gonna try it. We're gonna see how this goes. So, behind these doors lie spellbiting adventures. Fant no, the hat's just straight up coming off. So, when we say forever, we mean it. <laughs> it just like bounces right off my head, just so really. So, when we say forever, we mean it. <laughs> I like that.